My name is Isabel Thompson, and I'm Head of Data Platform at Digital Science. We're all about research, data, and getting the best insights as efficiently as possible. As you might be able to imagine, making that happen involves some very serious systems. I'm fascinated by systems. We're all part of various systems. The family unit, a team, a company, a society. If you've got work and communication taking place, you've got a system, though you may not necessarily have framed it as such. We can think about the systems we're in and reflect on how well or badly any of those systems are working at the moment. 2020 has been an incredibly disruptive year and all of our systems have come under unforeseen strain and change. And some systems have reacted more or less well than others. For example, many restaurants have successfully introduced delivery and managed to keep serving. Many professions have managed to shift completely to remote work, even if they wouldn't necessarily have expected they'd be able to do beforehand. But on the other hand, the number of video calls, for example, has pushed our internet connections to their limits at times. Uh, I'm sure we've all been on the end of uh, perhaps a reasonably important call that's been disrupted by someone's uh, bandwidth. And then more seriously, our healthcare systems have had to deal with waves of sudden increased demand and at times have been put, pushed to breaking point. So this year particularly, I think it's obvious that creating and managing systems well is an important, no, more than that, it's an essential topic. And I find it hugely surprising how unintegrated it is into everyday thinking. There is, however, um, a group of people who do think about systems every day, which in a, in a way that can be more or less explicit. And this group is technologists like us. During the course of my work, I've come across this set of principles called the reactive manifesto. It's a set of principles for building reactive, effective software systems. And while it's come out of software, its general principles apply uh, much, much more broadly because really it's a systems philosophy. <laughs> My view is that the principles here, the reactive manifesto, are so fundamental to building good systems that they really shouldn't be trapped in the programming world. <laughs> uh, so here I am today, um, unleash them, unbound them. Uh, um, really what I'd like to share is the principles of the reactive manifesto and some of the applications of that that I see and why I think they're relevant in uh, 2020 and as we look forward to next year. So the reactive manifesto, uh, what is it? The reactive manifesto was put together in around 2014 by a group of eminent uh, technologists. They saw, um, you know, looking at the world around them, that organisations across all kinds of different domains kept discovering patterns for software development that actually ended up looking the same, either superficially or as soon as you start to look up to the surface. And they noticed that these systems were more robust than other systems. They were more resilient. They were more flexible. They were better positioned to meet modern demands. They noticed uh, they noted that today's applications are deployed on everything from mobile devices to cloud-based clusters running thousands of multi-core processors. Users expect millisecond response times and 100% uptime. Data is measured in petabytes. Today's demands are simply not met by yesterday's software architectures. And uh, you know, that was written in 2014. If anything, this trend has just continued to accelerate since then. Everyone is trying to build robust, scalable, error-tolerant systems, reactive systems. And it turns out they tend to use the same patterns to get there. So the authors of the Reactive Manifesto put forward the argument that these design patterns are so important that we should actually be explicitly calling them out and explicitly architecting them. So what are these patterns? What is a reactive system? 
reactive system is one that is responsive, that is resilient, elastic, and message driven. Now, <laughs> we all get bombarded by terminology all the time, and these terms may or may not mean anything to you right now. I'm going to go through each of them because these four qualities here are the pillars of a reactive system. A little side note, you'll come across these principles and perhaps have already come across them in, in many guises. One approach that is in vogue at the moment is microservices, um, which you may be familiar with. Uh, using a microservices architectural style basically means uh, designing software applications as suites of independently deployable services. Um, so lots of little services to make up the whole rather than one monolithic structure. Why would you do this? Well, <laughs> to ensure responsiveness, resilience, elasticity, uh, and scalability, perhaps most importantly. A microservices design is in fact one way you can achieve a reactive architecture structure. So the two really go hand in hand. Microservices is, is an example of a reactive system design. And microservices, in line with this whole thing around reactive systems, microservices have seen a significant growth in popularity in the last 10 years. For example, Netflix had to change their entire architecture to deal with the challenge of suddenly streaming to the world. And to do this, they moved to microservice architecture. Um, I put a link there to the video, which is um, rather interesting. And um, perhaps, uh, even somewhat surprisingly, a 2018 survey of developers found that 90% of developers were pursuing a microservices strategy. I think what this shows is just how important reactive systems have become. Okay, so this is software, but in my view, it doesn't matter if you're architect architecting a piece of software, a sewage system, or a new company org chart. Regardless of the system you're building, you'll face a number of the same problems. And one of these problems is scalability, <laughs> the absolute bane of developers and CEOs alike. But if you can incorporate these principles into your system early on, the promise is that you will be able to manage to circumvent many of the problems of scaling. Your system will stay responsive. You can keep adding units and swapping others out. You can meet demand consistently, even when there are sudden rapid changes in the level of that demand, like during the pandemic. Of course, every system is different and these principles have to be applied thoughtfully and in a way that's appropriate for a particular domain. Architecting software is very different to architecting an organization in a, in a number of ways. Uh, you can't just hot swap people in and out of projects. You certainly can't delete them. There are <laughs> laws against that. Um, but these are general principles. And I think nevertheless, there are many commonalities that we can see across systems that make these pillars very relevant and thought provoking to explore. OK, so to the four pillars. The first one is responsiveness. What does it mean? Well, the manifesto says that responsiveness mean, means the system responds in a timely manner, if at all possible. It says responsibility, uh, responsiveness is the cornerstone of usability and utility. But more than that, responsiveness means that problems may be detected quickly and dealt with effectively. Responsive systems focus on providing rapid and consistent response times Resp rel <laughs> establishing reliable upper bounds so they deliver a consistent quality of service. That's crucial. This behavior in turn simplifies error handling and it builds end user confidence and encourages further interaction. All things I think we can agree we want from our system. But really, why does this matter? Well, it matters because we are people of limited time. Time is the ultimate commodity. Things are time sensitive. If you don't provide time sensitive things in a time sensitive fashion, then you've lost the game. This applies to buying stocks, supplying fresh food, responding to customer requests, delivering search results, 
When something is requested, you want to respond as quickly as possible. Of course, this sounds like a no-brainer, but these things get challenging when a system gets big. Companies fail to deliver bespoke customer care when they increase in size. But poor responsiveness is not an option. Can you imagine a sewage system not responding to your toilet flush? <laughs> that would be a major problem. It would be unacceptable. Can you imagine farmers not picking apples uh, uh, for two months after the crop is ready? There goes their harvest. These things are all time sensitive to a greater or lesser degree. Of course, it's not enough to say you must ensure responsiveness. We all want responsiveness. Responsiveness is what we expect from a reactive system. You need the means of ensuring that responsiveness. And that comes from the other points, which I will unpack now. So the second point is resilience. The manifesto says that the system stays responsive in the face of failure. That's when it is resilient. This applies not only to highly available mission critical systems, any system that is not resilient will be unresponsive after a failure. It specifies that resilience is achieved by replication, containment, isolation and delegation. I'm going to focus on replication in a minute. Failures are contained within each component um, and so components are isolated from each other, ensuring that parts of the system can fail and recover without compromising the system as a whole. Recovery of each, deponent is, of each component is delegated to another component, which is external from itself, and high availability is ensured by replication where necessary. The client of a component is not burdened with handling its failures. Okay, there's a lot there, but you know, let's talk about some human examples. What does it mean to be resilient? It means that you have the means to carry on when something isn't going quite right. People are resilient. We need our organisations to be resilient, especially at the moment. And we're starting to see which companies and industries are resilient and which are not. Resilience means the system carries on no matter what the circumstances are. Resilience is a core principle of system design in general, so I'm sure you're familiar with it. And we see it built in all over the place, even when we don't necessarily think of it. For example, if your computer mouse breaks, uh, you can still carry out a lot of tasks. But let's think of an example from the current moment. During COVID-19, when we go to a shop, we have to sanitise our hands, usually with a sanitizer dispenser that's laid on. Uh, that's the case in the UK anyway, I don't know about elsewhere. But if there's only one hand sanitizer dispenser, then what happens if it needs refilling or if it breaks? Your system is not resilient. It's not responsive to new people coming in who need to sanitize their hands. You might need to replace or repair this dispenser to hot swap a new dispenser in. Being able to swap in components is an important part of resilience. But another part of resilience is redundancy, that replication that I mentioned. If you add a second dispenser to your system, now if one breaks, the other one just carries on. You've got continuity of service. That second dispenser is also doing some of the work even when both are working, so you've increased your throughput and responsiveness even when both are working. Simply by doubling up, we've now created a much more resilient hand sanitizing system. So the crucial point is you need to be able to carry on. You need a backup. What's your backup? What's your contingency plan? What if a data center goes down? What if a senior developer gets ill or the CEO goes on holiday? Can you carry on as efficiently as you need to be able to? The third principle is that a system needs to be elastic. And what that means is that the system stays responsive under varying workloads. Reactive systems can react to changes in the input rate by increasing or decreasing the resources allocated. This uh, actually suggests that designs that 
you know, don't have contention points or central bottlenecks. Reactive systems support predictive as well as reactive scaling algorithms um, and provide live performance measures. And they achieve elasticity in a cost-effective way on commodity hardware and software platforms. Okay, so bringing in elasticity, it looks like it supports resilience and responsiveness. Um, we're used to this idea in software. Um, this one's actually probably very familiar. For example, processing API requests. If there's a sudden surge in requests, can you automatically scale up your resources to manage those requests? And then, just as importantly, can you easily return to your previous level when the surge sub subsides? If you can, this is elasticity. You need it because things change all the time. Anything that you build will be out of date almost uh, as soon as you finished it, if not before. And so this is really all about intelligently balancing the workload across the resources at your disposal. You want core and extensible bandwidth. I think an interesting example of this is in employment models. Contractors, for example, um, allow a certain amount of elasticity to a company's bandwidth. It's common in software, it's common in consulting. Um, for a firm which might have a number of full-time employed staff, as well as a network of contractors that they call on to handle a big project if one comes along. They choose this elastic approach because it wouldn't be cost-effective or sensible to employ all those consultants full-time when you have an unpredictable number of projects coming in. You want to be able to scale up and scale down in the most efficient way possible. We also see elasticity built into modern business models of companies like Uber or Airbnb two obvious examples. Um, their systems can easily add more drivers or properties or customers to the system when demand strikes and, in deal, and indeed their system can handle varying demand. So that's elasticity. It's about intelligently managing resources. But before I move on, I also just want to cover an important sub point that was hinted at on the previous slide, which is the idea of avoiding bottlenecks. As an example here, uh, we can think of a startup CEO. This is again quite a human example. At first, all the decisions, big and small, might go through the CEO. But if you maintain this approach as you grow, the responsiveness of the system drops and you've got a bottleneck. The CEO can't expand their capacity to deal with the increase in requests. You have to add more nodes, or people in this case, and also arrange successful delegation, so no one node gets overwhelmed. How do you do that? Well, here is the fourth and crucial part of a responsive, uh, of a reactive system. And that is that it should be message driven. The reactive manifesto says of message driven architectures, it says reactive systems rely on asynchronous message passing to establish a boundary between components. That ensures loose coupling, isolation and location transparency. This boundary also provides the means to delegate failures as messages. Employing explicit message passing enables load management, elasticity and flow control by shaping and monitoring the message queues in the system and applying back pressure where necessary. Okay, so I mentioned that in a resilient system, you need to be able to hot swap units in and out. If one fails, you can replace it with another. And in an elastic system, you want to be able to bring in more units as required. Well, to do both of these things, you have to have a well-structured messaging system. A well-structured messaging system is what enables the other principles. It's what lets your system grow. Because if you have the right communication structure in place, you can keep adding to it and you can keep communicating across it. Um, let's break this down a bit because there are a few interesting points here. So firstly, let's think again of our startup CEO. 
Um, at first, all of the responsibilities lie on her shoulders. Strategy, fundraising, product design. But if the company is successful, it's going to reach a breaking point pretty soon. So you have to split responsibilities. But you'll only manage to split responsibilities effectively if you have good communication. The CEO says, this is what I require from you. And the employee can report back, okay, I've done it now. Obvious, right? Um, I mean, yes. <laughs> but without good communication, you end up with work not being managed effectively. The second point is that good communication is important for managing workloads effectively. Good communication means clear, explicit messaging. It means you have documented and tracked messaging, which lets you monitor message queues in the system. In software, the messaging system means that a component can communicate if it's under pressure to its upstream component. So the system can make adjustments upstream to reduce that load and hence make sure that the original component doesn't fail, which could put pressure on the whole system. That's the last thing you want, that one unit becomes so overloaded that your whole system goes down. In organisations, we experience the same type of thing. Explicit communication means that a manager can see if a team member is becoming overloaded, and then they can react to that. They can distribute work to another team member, or if it's ongoing, they can make a pitch for an extra head in the team. This avoids someone becoming so overworked, they get ill, which could impact the, the entire team or the entire company negatively. And then thirdly, in programming, a message-driven architecture enables asynchronous communication. This means that a component um, sends a message to another with a request and the next component fulfills their request when it has availability. One example of asynchronousity. Uh, in this situation, it's like email. I send an email to a colleague and they pick it up and work on it when they next can. It's different from me picking up the phone and asking them to do it and then doing it straight away. Asynchronous communication is a particularly interesting point, I think, at the moment in the context of remote and distributed work. Now that we can't be in the same room together, we've all become more reliant on asynchronous communication. At Digital Science, uh, which was 50% remote even before the pandemic, we use a lot of tools, um, specifically around enabling effective asynchronous communication. Um, for example, from a previous job, I see a difference from a preference for uh, uh, Google Docs over Word. Um, and this is because you can work on a document seamlessly, jointly, more easily um, at different times. Um, make some edits and then come back and someone else has changed it further for commenting and such like. Um, also Slack, email, Jira, of course the, the list goes on. You still need to sync up in meetings, that is essential. Um, and in software as well, things have to be synced, but you're not reliant on the meetings to get the job done. An asynchronous workflow has a number of advantages. Um, if you think about it, asynchronous workflows is something that allows you to bring in talent from across different time zones to work collaboratively. Never has it been more important to companies to have a reactive architecture than right now during the pandemic. I think we see that those who have not built the tools for asynchronous and reactive workflows are the ones that are struggling the most right now. As an example, Think of our beloved universities. Lots of people in one room for a university lecture. This has been the predominant university model for years. And now, and now universities are suddenly having to change and some are able to do that more successfully than others. They're having to become more reactive to develop new systems for educating people regardless of their location. And this is changing the university system right before our eyes. This is something I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. I work predominantly with dimensions in my role. And for those of you who don't know what we do, we provide um, big data and insight on the research ecosystem to universities, funders, companies, and of course, publishers. 
for these organisations, it's critical to make the right decision at the right time. And so I've been thinking a lot about what would help them make the right, uh, get the right information more easily, more flexibly, more scalably. And that requires looking to these reactive principles. Uh, some of you may have seen that we launched integration of dimensions data with Google BigQuery recently. And I think this is one way to look at that integration as well. BigQuery is a cloud data warehouse for analytics and visualization. So our integration allows our clients to perform incredibly flexible, powerful on-demand analytics. That is to say, it allows them to create insight reactively, to create bespoke analytics or dashboards in response to new and changing internal requests. Now their analytics capability can be more responsive. Their internal decision makers, editors, marketers can be more responsive because they've got live updating information, citations, emerging trends. The BigQuery infrastructure is important too. Because BigQuery is serverless, a customer can slot dimensions into their existing workflow without the need for a developer resource, plug and play. You know, a client will have a more or less reactive system design themselves. But now they can plug us in directly to their system, regardless of what they had before, and thus make their system more reactive, and it makes their insight more scalable. Now they can access the insights they need when and where they need them. I believe this kind of flexible, integratable approach is essential, particularly at the moment. There's never been a more critical time to do whatever you can to help people have all the information they need so they can make the most well-informed decisions possible. Non-reactivity is not an option. So in summary, the reactive manifesto says that software systems should be architected to be responsive, resilient, elastic, and message driven. But these principles are really a systems philosophy and they apply to organizations and other systems too. We're all building our reactive architectures to be able to grow and change as circumstances change. This is the kind of thing that's essential, you know, whether that's to meet evolving demands for a great customer experience, or to deliver new on-demand insight. We have to keep changing because <laughs> although we have just about made it through 2020, you never know what will be around the corner in 2021. Thanks very much and look forward to talking later. <laughs>